social worker, as a caregiver, I feel frustrated with systems and with outcomes and I feel frustrated with people who are demanding things that are not possible. I'm, I'm on a personal journey to get more in touch with my feelings and to be okay with those hard emotions because I think as a social worker, it's not always appropriate to let those emotions out. What does loving your neighbor actually look like? This is Journey with Care, where curious Canadians get inspired to love others well through real life stories and honest conversations. Imagine dedicating your life to helping others, only to face relentless emotional challenges in a system that often leaves you feeling powerless. Have you ever wondered what keeps social workers going despite the odds? Johan here. Today we're kicking off a new series, Battery of a Caregiver. We're exploring the lives of those who dedicate themselves to caregiving roles. We'll uncover what it takes, their self-care strategies, and how our communities can provide much needed support around them. Joining us today is Rebecca, a passionate social worker and case manager, and we'll discuss self-care and the toll it takes to work in the field of social work and the emotional toll of absorbing others' trauma. We'll also discuss how churches can play a pivotal role. By the end, you'll see how simple acts of gratitude can significantly uplift those dedicated to caring for others. But before we get into the episode, I want to remind you to check out Journey with Prayer, a corresponding five-minute devotional episode to start off your week. You can go grab the link in the show notes or simply just pause this episode, go on your podcast player, and look up Journey with Prayer and follow. Or you can check out the website as well. Uh, you can get the episodes earlier on our website, careimpact.ca slash podcast. Also, this podcast is made possible through generous donors like you. It does take financial resources to keep producing these stories and episodes weekly. So if you'd like to become a fellow sojourner, or maybe you're part of a business and want to sponsor an episode, uh, maybe you want to promote your work in the community or an upcoming event, you can also head over to careimpact.ca slash podcast to get more involved. Okay, I'm really excited about this interview with Wendy and Rebecca. Rebecca has joined us on a past interview and the feedback was nothing but positive. She's a great communicator, has a huge heart, and is a longtime friend of mine and a friend of Care Impact. You don't want to miss this one. Now on with the interview. Today, I'm thrilled to have with me a guest in our studio, Rebecca, to talk to me all about being a social worker and what it looks like to take care of self and to be cared for in community. And you will hear a bit of community in the, the background. We're in our neighborhood, in my Shasta, and right around us, there are children and families enjoying the nice summer weather. But Rebecca, I want to just welcome you here to the podcast. Thank you, Wendy. It's great to be here. Good to have you here, too. We're looking at caregiving and you are a caregiver of all caregivers. When we think of caregiving from a day in and day out professional perspective, I can't think of anyone more in the field than a social worker. Can you tell me a little bit about your role as a social worker? Yeah, I would consider myself a case manager. So I have a caseload of a number of different families that I'm working with, um, primarily children, youth, and their caregivers. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm interacting with different ones, whether that's over the phone, over email, in person, attending meetings, answering questions, just kind of assisting them in system navigation. So is every day the same in the tasks that you do, or does it look differently? Like walk me through maybe a typical day or week in the life of being a case manager. I think it is a lot of the same, but it's the people in the situations that are unique. There's lots of similar facts and similar scenarios, but every person that I'm interacting with has their own story and they are coming with their own history. They're all coming to me as individuals. And so my role is to engage with them to kind of find out what do they need? How can I help meet those needs? How can I help connect them to other people if I'm not the right person to meet their needs? 
and really just to walk alongside people through what can be a really challenging season, some really complicated issues, and just to be there with them. Yeah. So when you're working with a youth or child or a family, they're at a point of crisis or a time of critical need, right? It's not just for some simple steps forward in life and dreaming again. You're doing some crisis intervention. Is that correct? In my particular role, people would be coming to me after they've had a crisis. And so I would be providing them with support information after to continue to kind of go through some subsequent processes to the traumatic incident that they've experienced. Mm. So, Rebecca, can you take us back to the moment when you first felt drawn into social work? What brought you into this field in the first place? And what helped spark that passion for you? I actually, growing up, I thought I was going to be a missionary. I pictured myself overseas, and that didn't play out exactly how I had anticipated. I moved from a small town to Winnipeg coming up on two decades ago, and I found myself working at a coffee shop, and I thought, I don't want to work at a coffee shop for the rest of my life. I I feel like God has called me to have compassion and to be a helper. And so I kind of went through my mental list of careers that involved helping, and I came up with nursing and social work, and I didn't know how I'd fare with bodily fluids. <laughs> so I, I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, I don't think that's going to go very well. So I decided to pursue social work. So you took the easy route and took social work, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> you don't exactly. have bodily fluids, but boy, do you deal with a lot of messes, don't you? But you were drawn into that. So along the way, as you were in your social work degree, as you were studying and preparing for this, taking your practicum, Do you feel that it adequately prepared you for what you now experience as social work? What's your perspective now in hindsight? (laughs) No, no, (laughs) didn't prepare me. I, uh, I don't think that there's any profession that you enter prepared for what you're actually going to do coming out of school. They might provide you with theories. They might provide you with guidance or some examples. Even in practicum, there's some degree of... This is more real, but until I was working as a social worker, fully fledged on my own with my own responsibilities, not being, you know, micromanaged or Mm -hmm. overseen directly day by day, I don't think I was really prepared for what I was stepping into. Yeah. and, And for many people who aren't in the role, I'm certainly not, but I've been journeying with those who are in the profession. I've noticed that they hold a lot of weight. In some ways, there's a lot of need to collaborate with many people. But when Mm -hmm. this person or this family is in your caseload, there's a lot of pressure. You're it (laughs) to make big decisions with them and to help navigate that. That's a big responsibility. How have you managed some of that as you get more and more cases, new cases coming on? How do you handle that when there's nobody else sharing that load with you? Well, fortunately... I'm not left holding the ball by myself. I'm fortunate to work within a team that includes a supervisor, that includes coworkers. And I remember reading an article way back when I was in school about why people stay, this was specific to child welfare. Why do people Mm -hmm. stay working in child welfare when it was, you know, it's widely known that that is a very challenging place to work in. Mm -hmm. And it was a study that was quantitative. They were having interviews with people. And by and large, people stayed because of their coworkers, because they felt like they were part of a team and they had people who had their back and they felt supported even when they were doing some really difficult work and really underfunded, under-resourced, challenging situations. They stayed because of their people. And I can certainly say that I don't feel like I am on my own doing what I do day to day. I'm also not on my own just within my team. I feel like there are, he made that point that as a service provider, I feel like we are always collaborating. We're always Mm -hmm. connecting. We're always looking for who else could support this family? Who else 
has something to offer, something to to give to them so that they don't feel like they're alone in this. But I have talked with people who don't feel like they're part of a team and it's really challenging to feel like you're it. Yeah, because the reality is there is a lot of turnover in a lot of teams, Absolutely. a lot of turnover, and maybe they're for good teams. It's not to say that the the team environment was bad, but it's stressful. Um, there's practicalities to being a good team when you're all busy and running in different directions, correct? Mm -hmm. And and taking on a lot of the, the stress. I understand that compassion fatigue is a huge item for caregivers, particularly in the social work field, in the profession. I was looking at the, the Canadian Association for Social Workers, and they were identifying that there was a, a huge turnover due to burnout and compassion fatigue have you experienced any of that in in some of the the good work you're doing but you just didn't have enough to give you felt in that that moment even with a good team can you identify with any of that I think that I left before I got to that point you left where I left the the space where I was working okay. a previous position where I could see the possibility of that cropping up within me and I made a decision to see if there were other options available to me and there were and so I was able to make a change and I would say by and large avoid that but then I can remember times when I would go to social gatherings and I remember one person in particular saying you look like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders mm. but, oh that's that's not how I want to live yeah and it clearly it wasn't like, I feel like, oh, I'm, you know, kind of keeping it, holding it together, not stressed. But obviously that wasn't the truth. Your body was showing that you were under a tremendous amount of, of stress. Yeah. Which is understandable when you're dealing with many different cases. And and how do you separate yourself from some of the crises that you're walking, you're journeying with them? You care deeply for their outcomes. But how do you not take that with you? It's really hard. Mm. It's really hard. I went to a vicarious trauma workshop. I actually went to it twice because I thought this is so important. And it was such a good training. And recognizing that even though I wasn't the one who was experiencing all these traumatic events personally, as a caregiver, I was absorbing them. Mm-hmm. I was absorb absorbing the trauma of the traumatized people that I was walking alongside. Mm -hmm. And that was impacting me more than I thought. And that workshop had a lot of great ideas about how to process your emotions and making sure that you had good supports in place. You were practicing self-care. You were creating trauma-free zones within your workplace. But at the end of the day, it was up to me to implement those things that I had learned. And some days I did a good job of it. And other days I looked like I had the weight of the world resting on my shoulders. And what are some ways that you've helped mitigate that when you see that on your dashboard that, hey, I care deeply, but this is getting to me or I'm carrying it home with me? What are some practices that you've been able to? And I realize everybody has their own practices, but you found some some tips and some some strategies that have been working for you? Because how many years have you been in this now? Mm, 11. 11. Yeah. So it's not your first rodeo. No. It takes 11 years of day-to-day -day dealing with crisis and families in high needs. Um, what are some of those strategies that have worked? Maybe some that haven't. <laughs> oh, I think some of the things that have worked have been avoiding certain situations. I, I talked to a counselor and she's like, maybe you do need to expose yourself to some of this. Like, I don't like watching sad movies. Mm. I don't like anything that remotely reminds me of work. I have really firm fences in my personal time to not engage with news, media. I know I have a lot of coworkers who do not follow those same boundaries, mm -hmm. but for myself, I'm like, if I don't need to experience more trauma, I don't want to. And for me, those things are small T traumas. If I'm watching a movie that talks about things that I can, I, I can correlate with my work. Um, I walk a lot. Mm -hmm. I walk when I'm on the phone. 
I have earbuds. And While you're working on the phone? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At, it's funny. I I don't think it was really a conscious thing, mm -hmm. but I have noticed that once I have start having a phone conversation that I feel is going to be potentially challenging, or even if it isn't, I find myself pacing back and forth in my office because I remember from this training that I took so many years ago that our bodies dispel trauma through movement, mm. that that's really calming and centering. And so I find myself walking back and forth. You know, if I stay here for a really long time, there's going to be mm -hmm. a little worn out path in the carpet between the door and the window where I've yeah. walked my phone calls out. <laughs> oh, that's great. Now, I was having a conversation with you the other day and somebody said, hey, do I see you sitting on a park bench at lunchtime uh, yes. journaling or something like that? Is that something that you, you put into practice in your workplace that you, you get out for a bit? Yes. Yeah. I try to get out every lunch hour just to spend some time out in the fresh air, get some sun, get removed from my desk, from eating at my desk, from um, sometimes lunch rooms can be a really great little oasis to connect with people. And sometimes they are a place where people want to continue to talk about work. Mm -hmm. And so I have chosen not to engage in that. And I go for a little walk. I sit in a beautiful park. I listen to music. I pray. I sit and stare into space and think about nothing and let my brain kind of, you know, go where it wants to go and process through whatever it needs to process through. Now, I imagine in your day, you deal with a lot of and a variety of cases of, of crises and emotions and mental illness and and tragedies upon tragedies. Yet I sit here across from you and you have a very peaceful demeanor. Um, <laughs> you are very Thank positive you. and, and peace loving. And that's how I've known you to be. Uh, and you're very professional in not divulging personal information, which I appreciate you you hold and respect your your clients very dearly. But are there times, honestly, this is just a you question, not a mm. client question. Are there times, honestly, where you're just angry, where you're frustrated, you're annoyed when those emotions aren't on the happy, happy um, you, you feel all the other emotions that sometimes we don't feel the permission to. Yes. <laughs> you do. Okay. Because yes. <laughs> your smile isn't showing it to me, but I know it must. You're human then you're, yeah. what, is what you're saying. Yeah. I think more, more than frustration, I think I feel sad mm -hmm. more often. And I feel frustrated with systems and with outcomes and mm. I feel frustrated with people who are demanding things that are not possible mm -hmm. and I'm I'm on a journey a personal journey to get more in touch with my feelings and to be okay with those hard emotions mm. because I think as a social worker as a caregiver in that regard it's not always appropriate to let those emotions yeah. Out. Sometimes there are. I can say that I have cried with people mm -hmm. because we're we're humans. Mm -hmm. Like something hits you yeah. deeply, yeah. impacts you. Yeah, it would feel fake to plaster on a smile exactly. or just to be indifferent. It's like this actually is really, really sad and really mm. painful, and I'm feeling that with you. I think that's the the definition of empathy to to be with someone yeah. in their pain but yeah I definitely get frustrated with people who don't seem to understand or who continue to make choices that I can look down the line and see you know where it's going this is not good yeah been down this path before so when you see those things it's like if you were a battery and and it was fully charged Every time those things happen throughout the day, it can drain your battery, so to speak, right? It can. Yeah. So what are some of the things that fill your battery up that give you boosts of energy? Not that you're deriving your 
your energy from the outcomes of others, but what are some things in your day that add life and say, yes, this is why I'm doing this. This is, mm. this is what I'm here for. One of my first, well, no, she wasn't one of my first. She was my first supervisor. She had been working in social services for I think 40 years. Mm. And when I was talking with her about a situation where things had gone really well, mm-hmm. and she said to me, imagine this situation is a pebble. Mm-hmm. You take that pebble, you hold it, you keep it close in your hand, you put it in your pocket. And on those days where things are not going well, you put your hand in your pocket and you bring out your metaphorical pebble and you remember that there are people who are being impacted positively, that you are doing good work, that people can change, that there is hope. Mm -hmm. And this supervisor, to my knowledge, did not know or love Jesus, but I thought, yeah, yeah, I'm going to reflect on these good circumstances and I am going to choose to have hope when these situations feel hopeless because I have a lot of pebbles in my pocket by now. I can remember that, God, you're still at work even when things don't go the way that I want them to. And and your value of who you are in Christ and where God has placed you in the lives of these people is not diminished or increased based on the outcomes of that path, right? There's a lot of trust that goes into this. Tell me more. Trust that he's got them. Like these people who are just hot mess express, things are not going well. I choose in those moments to trust, like, Lord, I can't get through to this person, but I believe that you can. Mm -hmm. I believe that you have put many people along their path, that you love them and you care for them more than I ever could. And that despite, like, that's the definition of faith. It's the things that we can't see, that we believe he's at work, that he is going to redeem, that he's going to heal, he's going to deliver. And... Days I just throw up a quick little prayer. Oh, Lord, Jesus, help. I can't see the way forward, but I believe that you're good and you're faithful. I, I choose to trust in you in this moment for this person. And maybe in that ironic way, as the scripture talks about when we are weak, then we're strong. When we know we come to the end of ourselves, that's when we can really invite God into those places Maybe you just have a fast track to know that sooner, saying these circumstances are far greater than one social worker can change or one system or a team, even the best team or the best system, even if they were working perfectly, that when we come to the end of ourselves, we realize the strength of God. And maybe that's what I'm seeing in you Mm. after a full day of crisis after crisis and meetings after meetings and system bureaucracy that you, you deal with. You can still smile. Because maybe it's more than you, and maybe that's what you're representing here. That resonates with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I, I also um, was researching mental health among social workers. You get a bad beating day in and day out. This isn't because you're not strong or you're not equipped or you're not professional about it. But they're estimating about 45% of social workers when they're in the The field of social work in Canada have reported symptoms of mental health challenges and often related to anxiety, depression, PTSD, vicarious trauma. All of these things are things that people don't go in and and earn a social work degree saying, hmm, let me be. Sign me up. (laughs) Sign me up. It's a (laughs) 50-50. Can you speak to social workers or those that are interested in caring? God is still calling people to care. 100%. What can you tell people going in with those kind of statistics about caregiving? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Mm. It so feels cliched as it leaves my mouth, but honestly, that is what keeps me going. I feel like he has called me to this, Mm -hmm. that he has a plan and he has a purpose. And I... My practice is to spend time with him daily to reconnect, to go back to the source, because you're absolutely right. I don't have it in myself to take care of these people, to deal with all of the mess and the stress and continue to 
have joy and to feel peace. It's the Holy Spirit within me. And it's also staying connected, not just to the Lord, absolutely first and foremost, but also staying connected to other people and people who are healthy. There's, I have all sorts of people in my life, but I really need to make a concerted effort to stay connected to people who help to support me and to care about what's going on in my life outside of work and inside of work. Mm -hmm. But So tell me more about that. What does a caring connection look like in community? When do you feel belonging or supported even after a full day and you can't tell anybody the situation, you're sworn to confidentiality, and yet you are still Rebecca the human, not just the Rebecca the professional. So what does it look like to be human in community and be cared for in that? So I'm a single person. I live in community with other women, but I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. And so then I have, thank the Lord, he surrounded me with families mm. who have kids. And I spend time intentionally with these people. I go and play and get hugged and give hugs and enjoy bedtime routine and going to the park. I have a really amazing group of friends that, and just actually a couple, a few in particular that I can be really honest with about when things are going well and when they're not. Mm -hmm. And I can ask for prayer. That was actually, it's not something that's part of my life right now, but for many, many, many years, I was part of a prayer meeting that your wonderful producer, Johan, <laughs> was spearheading, uh, where the focus was specifically focused for people who were working or who were looking for a job. Eventually, it kind of morphed. It also was for people who were going to school, and it was so encouraging because here we were, we were not a big group. We were not a fancy group or a well-known group, but we were faithful. We were faithfully getting together and praying for our workplaces and praying for our coworkers, praying for our clients and our patients and our students. And every time that there was something work-related that I was feeling was heavy or I was, you know, wanting prayer, I could bring it to this group of people and they prayed for me. They prayed mm -hmm. with me. And that was really, really amazing. We are on a break, just, you know, seasons are, they come and they go, but say, find people who can pray with you. Well, and I think that's a great uh, invitation, actually, for churches. Every church I've gone to believes in prayer, but sometimes we think we need to be praying for the quote unquote missionary, the pastor, the ministry leader, the program that is under the church roof. But what if we flip the script? What if we prayed for those that are going into the marketplace, those that are going into the hospitals, into the courtrooms, into these places of crisis? You are an agent of care and compassion that we should be upholding. I love that idea. Can you give me other examples and ideas that churches could grab hold of? Or maybe there's a listener right now saying, you know what, I I'm part of a church, but I'm just not sure if I'm cut out for, I couldn't do what Rebecca's doing, and I'm not a foster parent, and I'm just not sure. And yet you're saying prayer has been instrumental for helping propel you forward. Are there other ways that people in the church can support people like you in the roles that you're doing? Uh, I, yeah, I'm off the top of my head, <laughs> one way is just to ask them. Mm -hmm. Like if you know a social worker, if you know a foster parent, if you know somebody who's working in a crisis service, you can ask them, how could I help you? How can I support you? How can I pray for you? Have them over for dinner. Mm. Just get to know them, build relationship with them, be a faithful friend. We all need more friends. And I think that would actually break down some barriers as well, because a lot of people in society, all they hear about a social worker is taking children and and being part of the system and, and all of these things that are so untrue mm -hmm. of who you are. 
and is a disservice if they would only get to know you and hear your story and your your heart of compassion, they too would be enriched, wouldn't they? I certainly think so. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I had a nickel for every time I tell people I'm a social worker, oh, that's really hard work. Like all jobs are hard. All jobs have rewarding parts to them and hard parts to them. And God calls us all to different roles. And I think that we all have a role to play when it comes to loving children and loving families. And I would just encourage you, ask the Lord, like, what is your role? How can you be part of the story that he is writing in the lives of children and families that are around you in your church community? Get connected with Carry Impact. Like, Yeah, and that's what we're passionate about at Care Impact is to come along and connect and equip these churches to care because we believe everyone's called to care. Mm -hmm. And there's ways that we can do so, not all trying to emulate who you are and who God created as you, but we believe that everybody has something within them to give, but sometimes we just need the tools and the connections to, to be able to do so effectively. One of the ways we've seen actually a shift in thinking, I would say, here in Winnipeg, as we've uh, engaged churches to care for those in need, and we've been bridging the church into connecting them with social workers, particularly in child welfare here in our city, um, we've seen shifts in thinking to, oh, got to stay away from CFS because they take children away or hearing some some hard stories, because there's a lot of hard stories, right? to, oh my goodness, having a, a heart of compassion for those workers that are in it day in and day out. And we've seen churches, not by our own initiative, rallying together those that are responsive to the care portal that we um, needs that we make available, saying, how can we love our social workers? How can we care uh, for them? And asking that question to social services and the cards and the, the cookies and the treats that are brought there. I've never seen such delight in social workers' eyes than to receive a simple thank you, a simple we see you, we're here for you, and we care. That is amazing. That 100%, that does not happen Mm -hmm. just day to day. People, particularly, I would agree, in child welfare specifically, but lots of different places where it's really thankless. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody to say, I see you, I see your heart. I see what God has placed to you in this space to do and acknowledging that. That's so beautiful. I remember one particular social worker as we were just giving them thank you. Just a very simple thing and some gift cards for Tim Hortons or something like that. Tearing up and said, you know what? We have been called a lot of things. We're used to receiving the F-bombs and being sworn at on a daily basis but we don't even know what to say when the church stands up and says, thank you. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, that's such a simple way to show compassion and fill the batteries up of those that are giving day in and day out. Are there other ways that you want to encourage our listeners? Maybe they're a social worker or considering it. Maybe they're wanting to support people like you in, in the caregiving profession. Anything advice that you would like to give some lasting words. I really love that. I love the idea of just saying thank you, just acknowledging, just like your words have so much power. Aside from connecting with them, building relationship and, you know, joining in with Care Impact in ways that you can bless people and bless social workers. A number of years ago, the AGM or the annual general meeting, basically the the large gathering of all of the people that I worked with was hosted by a church. And there were other events where the church opened up their space, provided food. And I was just blown away thinking, wow, the church is doing this for a bunch of social workers? And my coworkers who don't know Jesus, I don't know exactly what was going through their minds, but I can't help but think they were thinking the same thing. Wow, the church is doing this to support people who they don't know, who they've never met, who there's a lot of stigma attached to being a social worker. And that was really powerful. 
And I'm sure it cost the church money. It cost time to the people who made the soup and prepared the space and the food for us. It was time and money well spent, well invested, not just in blessing social workers, but being Jesus to people who otherwise may not have any really positive experience of what it looks like for Christ followers to actually do what he would do and to love the way that he loves. Well, I love that because I was there. I know you were. I didn't even know you then, but I was speaking there and and helped make that connection. That's what Care Impact does. And we're like, you know, I was talking with the CEO and saying, you know what, you're finding a hard time finding places. There are empty church buildings and people who care. I put myself out on the limb and churches showed up. <laughs> Thank you, churches. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were blown away. And out of that act, it was co-created. Social services needed to trust me with the church and the church needed to trust me with social services. And I saw this beautiful dance happening and people were confused (laughs) and emotional um, because they were being cared for so well. But out of that, we had around those tables, I, I asked and I challenged the social workers and said, at your desk right now, you have things on your desk that community needs to help you with. We can't do your job, we don't want your job, but there are ways that the community can be supportive. Can you write down those things that right now you could you would really benefit from the support of a compassionate community? What would that look like? Let's dream a little. So they were around their tables, they were they were all a buzz and everybody was talking and writing this down after uh, they they collected all the papers and somebody put them all together and synthesized all the same answers together. And out of that, over 90 different recommendations of how the community could care for them and for their families to make their job a whole lot better and to make the outcomes that much better for community. Out of that came the invitation to sit around their table. And out of that (laughs) came the opportunity for, wouldn't it be cool if we had technology and care sharing technology came into Canada as a result of that, because the social services allowed the church to care for them and the church dared to care for those uh, that were serving these children and families. And that's part of our story. You're, you're telling part of our story and it gets me excited because God has allowed us to utilize this care sharing technology for big systems that are have so much needs mm-hmm. day in and day out. And here's a practical way they can enter in a need. I just saw one today. There's a, a youth who is wanting education mm-hmm. and he is new to Canada, living on his own in assisted living and needing a desk and a chair. And now it's going out to all the churches and say, who has a desk? Who has a chair? And how can we make this connection possible so that this youth knows he's cared for and this social worker knows she's not alone? And so I get pretty jazzed up about that. And I'm so grateful and so thankful for you as a social worker and what you bring to our city, to Winnipeg, to the church, and for what you are sharing with our audience here today. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you, Wendy. That really means a lot. Thank you for joining another conversation on Journey with Care, where we inspire curious Canadians on their path of faith and living life with purpose in community. Journey with Care is an initiative of Care Impact, a Canadian charity dedicated to connecting and equipping the whole church to journey well in community. You can visit their website at careimpact.ca or visit journeywithcare.ca to get more information on weekly episodes, Journey with Prayer, and details about our upcoming events and meetups. You can also leave us a message, share your thoughts, and connect with like-minded individuals who are on their own journeys of faith and purpose. Thank you for sharing this podcast and helping these stories reach the community. Together we can explore ways to journey in a good way. And always remember to stay curious.